Welcome everybody to Radicalized Truth Survives, episode 109. My name is Heidi Kuda, and today Jim Hi-Fi and I are interviewing my brilliant colleague from Byline Times, Dr. Nafiz Ahmed, who has an upcoming book titled Alt-Reich, and we're going to tell you how we collectively can defeat this networked insurgency. Oh, Nafiz, we are so happy that you've joined us today. Uh, we're really excited about this conversation, and it could not have come at a more interesting moments, certainly in U.S. history. We had a number of uh, events happening yesterday that actually exposed how many people in America are actually taking cash from Russians to do uh, to super spread Russian propaganda and how these networks are connected. And networks happen to be your sweet spot. So before we talk about some of your recent reporting and your upcoming book, is there any comment that you have about kind of the explosive uh, events of yesterday? Well, I think what we're starting to see is that the, the Russian state has actually for some decades been pursuing a very concerted strategy that's been quite well thought out. It doesn't mean it's super coherent in every way, but it's definitely been poured over and well thought out. And it's a strategy to subvert and destroy and dismantle uh, and destabilize Western democracies as a whole, not just one democracy, but the very concept of democracy and even the structure of the international order that's developed around democracies. And I think what's just happened is, is an illustration of how deep and how far this has gone, really, that it's, it's, it's getting to the point where you know, we've got clear evidence of money exchanging hands, you know, deliberate tampering with uh, political processes, attempts to influence, you know, foreign influence operations, the stuff that, you know, might be seen as, you know, like a, a fiction thriller or a Hollywood m movie, you know, but it's actually, you know, what we're seeing is so much of this is actually, is actually all too real and it's astounding. It is unbelievable. And, and just picking up on that word real, I know the guys have so many questions, as do I. But one thing that really devastated me is I was up reading this 277-page affidavit uh, about the seizing of 32 domains that the Russians had been using to create these doppelganger sites. And what was devastating is in reading the Russians' own internal documents, when they talk real to each other about America, it's like we are so easily manipulated here. It's like they absolutely know the truth about us. And that is where they go in and then exploit us. And one example of that, they knew that the economy in America was strong, which was not going to help Trump get elected. So they looked for ways to divert our minds from the fact that we were in a period of success. And that devastated me. I'm used to trying to prove the lies, but here I am reading truth about my country from the Russians. And uh, I just have no idea how we break through to the people who don't realize that they're, they're posting Russian propaganda all day, calling themselves patriots. It's, it's just a bit devastating to me to see this reality mapped out. Well, I have to say, I, complete, I mean, I completely agree. Um, I haven't seen the affidavit myself. But it's um, it's pretty it's a pretty strange place we find ourselves in, where this you know the, you know we have now a, a, a political system in which so-called alternative facts and alternate realities are literally dominating the political landscape. You have okay. you have bizarre worldviews, which millions of people have now come to believe and i think what's really is i think this is the thing is that i think in in the media when you know the, looking at the way you know your average pundit looks at this everything just seems to be a kind of bizarre series of accidents and i think what and i think the key thing i think many of us may may working you know talking here that the, the stuff that we've been all working on separately but we, what we all seem to be seeing is that this is not an accident there are there are groups of people who have been working together to deliberately attempt to 
bring people into a way of seeing things which is actually completely completely dislocated from reality and it's full of tropes that they've you know increasingly are taking for granted we've, we've been seeing these tropes right explode on our on our tv screens we saw them explode in the 6th january insurrection we saw them explode on the streets of, of the uk um just a couple of months ago in fact less than less than a, not a couple of months really um just a few weeks um and this is this, these are just examples right but it's but it's not just that it's like this is the, it's the connection between these seemingly disparate events but the 6th january insurrection the riots in the, in the uk the war in ukraine you know the elections of donald trump the elections of nigel farage these are not things which are disconnected they're intimately connected and they're part of not necessarily i mean this, some people would say oh so you're talking what you're saying is you're, you're you're referring to a conspiracy theory no we're not talking about a giant singular cabal this is a heterogeneous network of people who actually disagree with each other on lots of things but they're getting more and more aligned around these shared alternate realities you know these shared crazy ideas and i think i think that one of the things that i found most scary about this and i think I, I when I came across um Jim your uh, your your Substack recently and I I was like wow this guy gets it because I I've been for the last few years have been saying guys we're not just dealing with neo-nazis these are literal nazis <laughs> like actual nazis that like they actually believe really crazy nazi ideas and they don't want us to understand that and there's very few of us who recognize how deep that rabbit hole goes so I was actually quite um heartened uh to see that um you guys have been tracing these networks and recognizing how nefarious some of them are and of course that doesn't mean that everyone in the network is a nazi of course not majority of the followers of these groups probably would would imagine that they hate nazis and would vehemently say oh, we hate nazis we don't like nazis blah 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 but many of the people who lead some of these groups actually do harbor sympathies with nazis i mean and now it's starting to become harder to conceal like with the uh tucker carlson interview with an actual holocaust denier and then you've got the guy who's like richest dude in the world running the most powerful town square in the world just saying that's worth watching take it take a look he's got a point <laughs> i mean i just i'm looking at this stuff and i'm like how can this, this is what is happening yeah this is actually yeah. crazy this is how are we living in this reality right now this doesn't make sense this I is the, per the perfect place to talk about your new book alt reich gentlemen i know you guys have had a advanced copy why don't you lead this well i i just uh you were talking about connections and since your your upcoming book is on the, the alt reich and the the neo-nazi neo-fascist sort of um uh movement um what are your thoughts on the connection between the russians and the neo-nazi movement um, because what i have seen is a lot of overlap um for example i'll just give the you know one of the earliest uh websites uh, called iron march where a whole lot of these nazi groups were basically created and and uh, incubated was was on a website from a guy who graduated from M MGIMO uh, in in Moscow, basically spy school. Um, so I, I've seen that that for, for me, it seemed like a lot of the the neo Nazi movements, while they already existed here, it's not like they created them. But I have seen a lot of uh, encouragement and uh, sort of uh, growing of these communities um, being aided and embedded by the Russians. I'm curious if you've seen that. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think this is one of the interesting things that I've that I've tried to um, document in the book is that there is, of course, as you as you said, that, that there are these far right movements. They're real. Um, but understanding the history and how they evolved is key because it's all started in a very strange, murky way. And it, the, the way in which these groups started, and if we imagine, we, you know, we go back to the 1940s, you know, and, and you know, not the Nazis have been defeated. 
what I found astonishing was, first of all, how Nazi ideology itself was actually co-developed and co-evolved in relation to, you know, kind of a, a nascent kind of American fascism that was much more focused on on uh, on black people rather than anti-Semitism. Um, and these guys were literally vibing of each other, like in, in, in the 20s and 30s. They were sharing literature. You had Nazi. Yeah, Henry Ford was in, uh, mine, was thanked in Mein Kampf, right? Ab absolutely, yeah. yeah. And it's astonishing you see how that developed, like to the point that you know, the Nazis, you know, they, it was it was weird how it developed. Like you had you had uh, people in 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 the states who were looking at the Nazis and saying, "Wow, those guys are doing coming up with some great ideas," and then they take those ideas and then they implement them. In then they just started calling for, um, you know, they had they had like laws passed in Congress, you know, segregation stuff like that, calling for repatriation of of, of, of Black Americans, and then and then the Nazis were looking at that and they were like. Wow, that's 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 brilliant. They, those guys are actually doing stuff politically. We should be doing that. And they were inspired, and they took those ideas and they designed their own, you know, the Nazi sterilization laws and all that kind of stuff was inspired by, by that. And then, and then it was just it was this kind of cycle that they kept mutual inspiration, um, and they kept connections. So what was fascinating to me was after the Nazis were defeated, it was like everyone kind of woke up and was like. We can't be Nazi. This is post-Nazi world now that we're in. But the Nazis were still there. Like in like obviously in Germany they were they were defeated. But the people who believed this ideology, they were in Europe, they were in America. And most interestingly, they were people who were in the Nazi regime who had been, you know, they who were basically courted by the Americans. And this is now well documented. There are dozens of books about this we heard about operation paperclip and there were loads of nazi scientists that were taken to the united states to get the nazi secrets but they went beyond that and one of the kind of most controversial organizations that people know a bit less about is the richard uh, gellen organization and this guy was kind of like head of the nazi deep state um and he became essentially the you know the pre-cia cia's organization the oss that was the that was the kind of the big kind of american intelligence apparatus it was operating during the war and though no, they sh and, the, and the theater of concern shifted from okay now we, we were concerned about the nazis now we're concerned about communism and so this is quite anti-communist has become a euphemism basically for people who agreed with hitler in the first place yes. in my experience absolutely um, so what i found so interesting was how like today right we have these terms used all the time right the regressive left you know the the the, the you know everyone's communist and all this you know the, all this stuff about um this the, you know the the that the, the great replacement theory is one thing that people talk about which has evolved more recently but even at the time around the 1950s you had all this talk about um this it was basically an anti-semitic conspiracy theory about left-wing jewish marxists who they say were coming to america with cultural these, marxism right oh, yeah, cultural marxism yeah with these radical ideologies and so cultural Marxism, how did that evolve? What's really interesting is the these this this whole network of Nazi spies and intelligence officers and um torturers and war criminals and SS officers, these people were recruited in the thousands by the OSS in order to now monitor the Soviet Union. Um and these guys were crazy. They were obviously crazy because we knew what they were like, but they were doing all sorts of things. They were feeding America and Europe false intelligence about the Soviet Union. They were, it was in their interest in order to survive, in order to kind of uh, justify their existence to say that, that's, that there's this huge monumental threat. And dozens of CIA officers at the time, you know, the OSS eventually turned into the CIA. Um, they, they, they've spoken out about how so much of the of the narrative that was created at that time was actually just bollocks, like it, was, it wasn't it was real. And it was deliberately inflated. And these guys were doing that because it just allowed them to justify their existence and get more money, throw us more money, 
give us more on it like you know, we want we want less accountability and they were doing secret operations they were blowing stuff up in europe um and blaming it on the soviet union that's not to say that there were not issues obviously the soviet union was a terrible regime it was a it was also arguably in its own way a genocidal regime in the way that it was destroying the lives of hundreds of thousands of millions of people um millions of workers the lives were devastated but was the soviet union about to invade america you know there wasn't any evidence of that were they actually about to invade europe actually they weren't so the threat was exaggerated and the nazis benefited so here's what's really interesting is that during the cold war that was all going on but and you can see how i mean what i what I, one, of, one of the things i tried to do was trace the evolution of the american and european far right and how it was kind of these kind of Nazi ideologies were beginning to kind of change and they were influenced by this desire to justify, you know, fighting the civil rights movement in the United States. So they began drawing on these ideas, but they also needed to kind of, they had to change the way they portrayed themselves. One of the organizations that were, was at the center of this was the Nazi Pioneer Fund, which was this foundation set up in the 1930s, you know, while the Nazis were around, had very direct links with Nazi officials, Nazi scientists, and so on and so forth. This was an American foundation actively campaigning against the civil rights movement. It had huge ties with Republican politicians like Jesse Helms and others who were kind of luminaries of the anti-civil rights movement. And they were basically, they you had literal nazi ideology eugenics ideology at the core of all of this and i think to, to so I, i've taken this really long route in answering your original question jim so i apologize for that but let me so let me jump forward a bit no please don't so what, that that was uh, amazing i'll i will throw one name on the pile for of what you said which is jack singwab jack yeah. singwab was was one of the, the founders of the OSS and one of the founders of CIA. And he happens to be Mike Flynn's um, mentor and gave him his uh, nonprofit. That guy is is basically, you know, sort of the, wow. a, a central character through the whole story you just told. So and uh, and no apologies necessary. Never, Keep going. Definitely. It's like it's like music to our ears, believe us. Well, I mean, just to, I mean, to jump, I mean, that's fascinating. I wasn't even aware of that connection with Mike Flynn. I mean, that's just, that's just like the disgusting icing on the cake, isn't it? It's, it's, it's wild. Right. It's very close. His, his mom was, it was uh, best friends with Phyllis Schlafly, uh, who was, uh, it, it, you know, she started the anti-abortion movement. She killed the ERA. Um, and all of these guys are extreme, um, extreme catholic uh fascists and uh, you know unfortunately a lot of this overlaps with um you know very extreme parts of of the catholic church um you know probably outside of our bounds here but uh it's a it's an interesting connection anyway i apologize yeah God. i mean that's what's so fascinating about these networks is the way in which they have extended and expanded themselves and I think one of the key things about this that is illustrated by what you just said as well is the way that they adapt and they and they, the way that they conceal their ideology tactically in order to adapt to really different contexts and different environments. And this is what happened after the Cold War. Um, you know, the Cold War ended, Soviet Union collapsed. You had a different Russia coming into being. And this was when thing that, you know, the geopolitical order was shifting. And as Russia became a different entity, you know, like it became much more um, as it kind of became marketized and, we ha and became this kind of oligarch, it's kind of bizarre kind of authoritarian oligarchic capitalist crony system. It, it began to um, realize that in order for in order to, you know, as you know, it wanted to kind of um, change its relationship with Europe and change its relationship with, with the United States, it began to see the far right as an opportunity. And so many of these groups that, you know, historically had come about saying, 
you know, communism is like this and the left is like that and blah, 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 blah. Ironically, they became these ideal bedfellows for Putin. So one, so one of the things we see over the like the 1990s to the 2000s and onwards is, you know, these proliferating political parties and movements. Um, and all of them kind of like, many of them having these historical connections to Nazi parties. So, you know, you go, you know, you go across the continent to parts of Europe, you've got like in Austria, you've got the FPO, um, you've got the Sweden Democrats, you got um, different, you know, you've got various different political parties from so much, from all these different, you know, like the, the AFD. Um, and yeah. Yeah. So, so, so not all of them, but some of them have these really strong historical connections to the Nazi, I mean, even the, you know, the Belgian Vlaams, Vlaams Belang, um, you know, proper historical Nazi parties, right? And they've, they've, then, they've then evolved through this period. And then now they're saying that, oh, we're not Nazi, we're actually anti-Nazi. Uh, we, we don't like um, anti-Semites. Actually, we love, we love Israel. Um, and, and, and then these proliferating networks with, with Russia, they all, all of these politicians suddenly getting courted by Russia today. Um, and, you know, now we're finding we're finding evidence of, of you know, there's, there's documents emerging of commu secret communications between Russian officials, uh, Russian companies, Russian media uh, officials and people working across these different parties and actively talking about how they want to coordinate and how they want to undermine your Western democracy. And people have even done kind of academic studies of these, these parties, you know, because I mean, to go into all the different networks and, and funding kind of evidence is, is colossal. There's so much evidence of money that has gone to different parties, connections between different officials. But just look at some of the, some of the, st the studies that have been on the voting patterns of these parties in Europe, they're all pro-Russia. And they all take these very standard lines. They're like, oh, we, we think Putin is a great, strong leader. We think that the war in Ukraine is actually Europe's fault. Nothing, it's not Putin's fault. And we think Europe needs to do more on that. We think there should be, um, we should reduce the sanctions on Russia. And how, how ironic that the Republican Party, which kind of, you know, has called itself are with a kind of hawkish party of uh, you know, going against the external enemy has been completely and thoroughly infiltrated and co-opted by Russian finance, Russian intelligence, Russian ideology, um, with, with Trump at the epicenter. I mean, it's absolutely astonishing. And these guys call, them, call themselves patriots. That's it's unbelievable. I, there's the rub. You are making a, me think about Putin's uh, paleo-conservative moment by Pat Buchanan a decade ago, where he basically was like, look at this man who believes in the traditional values. So there's a moment where these guys went public with this. And of course, we talk a lot on this show about how the heads of our intelligence agencies took jobs working directly for these oligarchs which makes it very difficult if you're in the FBI to actually be trying to root these people out when the person who used to be the leader of the FBI is now lobbying for Semyon Mogolovich or Oleg Deripaska or any number of these people. Um, I uh, know that Hi-Fi wants to jump in. I've got one question, Hi-Fi, and then you go, okay? My question for you is one of your areas of profound expertise is in the networked insurgency. And you talk about the techno-utopian imperialist fascism in chapter 10. And can you give us a tease on that? And I ask because so much of what we do, and Hi-Fi being a Silicon Valley technologist, is we look at these networks. But I also think it's really important. My friend Dietmar Piklar, who is a Vienna-based disinformation analyst, said one of the things that's important to realize when you're talking about the UK and America is we share the same language. So I think that there's actually something there that even is more profound in tying this networked insurgency together because what happens here is very much 
understood in Britain? And I don't know uh, how to even answer that question, but I would love for you to give us a tease about how much of this truly is networked and how so much of it runs through Silicon Valley. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things about this is that this is something which has evolved organically, right? It's not, it isn't a conspiracy in that sense. Of course, there are people actually conspiring. There are conspiracies taking place. Often those are criminal conspiracies, like what happened on 6th January. We saw clear evidence of a criminal conspiracy to, to undermine and subvert the American elections. You know, there are questions about different elements of what's happening in different parts of the world in that respect. Um, but I think what's interesting about this is how it's been the, the way in which it's evolved has been, you know, not has been a result of different processes taking place. And they've kind of converged in this weird way that, you know, no one could have probably predicted, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And that's what's interesting. So you've got, you know, on the one hand, you've got the ideological kind of flank of, of the alt Reich. So you've got some of these, like the not like the Pioneer Fund, you know, where you've got this fund that is funding eugenics research and funding scientific racism research. Um, you know, one of the centerpieces in this is the is the, this guy Charles Murray, you know, who wrote The Bell Curve. Um, and it's unbelievable that this book, which basically says black people are stupider than white people, women are also stupider than men. And there's nothing we can do about it. It's, a gen it's, it's, it's a combination of environment, but fundamentally driven by genetics, you know, and nothing we can do in policy will ever repair this. It will get wider and wider. So it has these policy prescriptions, right, which are, oh, don't need the welfare state then or at all. Just destroy the welfare state. Um, recognize that you know, anyone who isn't white and male is has a propensity to inferiority um, recognize that any social problems are actually to do with those groups of people and their genetic problems and actually need to be contained in some way or maybe we need to depopulate them in some way um, and all of this is really just for the benefit of humanity ultimately and that's the core of his book and what i found really weird and astonishing is how that guy and that book is just everywhere like all of these luminaries in in the in in you know the 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 right wing, the hard right, the far right, you know across the spectrum, they they keep meeting this guy and talking to this guy and quoting this guy, and it goes all the way from someone like, you know, Douglas Murray in the UK of the Henry Jackson Society to Jordan Peterson, um, you know the Peter Thiel, Peter Thiel. Peter, Peter, Peter Thiel and him were on the same side of an argument at the Manhattan Institute, which actually incubated Charles Murray, by the way, yes. um, on the same uh, on the same side of an argument that um, we should that college education was not necessary for the, the lowers, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. And, and it's it's jaw dropping because they're like. Uh, you know, a, um, uh, 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 Emmanuel is there, uh, uh, you know, from Clinton's administration, um, uh, Rahm Emanuel. I'm like, the hell are these people doing listening to this? Um, and they posed it as a debate between whether, whether Black people basically were too stupid to go to college. And it, it, it was just shocking how horrible it is. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but, but it triggered me because... The Manhattan Institute also ties back in to all of those sort of neo-Nazi uh, or Nazi movements, right? Because it was founded um, by Reagan's CIA director, um, uh, who uh, uh, was connected to all of those OSS guys. Anyway, I apologize. Uh, I, I, I'm fascinated. No, it's awesome to hear everybody geeking out because this is like, this is completely what we have been doing for years. And to find somebody so knowledgeable is such an incredible yeah, breath I of fresh it. air. It's so, it's just wonderful. High fidelity. Now we're going to get really, really nerdy. All right. So I'm a technologist and we keep talking about networks. And to me, networks are just the connections 
between nodes in a network. It could be a computer, a server, a database, whatever, right? And, and what we don't talk enough about are the nodes in this network. We talk about the network, their connections. We don't talk about the outcomes because a network is just one part of a system. And the outcomes of this system that I have seen are massive income inequality, a failure of the administrative state, poverty on the increase, child poverty on the increase. Uh, we have the abortion issue where women are bleeding out here in the United States. Uh, we see the riots in the UK. The outcomes are the issue here. How do we explain to people that these nodes and these networks are producing these outcomes and that's why your reality is twisted and broken right now. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one because I think what these networks and nodes are doing is exactly trying to destroy people's understanding of that reality. And that is their whole approach. That's what we see with, with Elon Musk. And I think that's what's fascinating about what's happened over the last few, you know, maybe 20 odd years as you know, the, you know, you have the ideology evolving, but then you have different groups who need to kind of find a way to use that ideology. And I think what's interesting about what someone like Charles Murray says is that it justifies all of that. So one of the interest, one of this, you mentioned the Manhattan Institute, Jim, and that's such an important connection because one of the founders of the Manhattan Institute was Sir Anthony Fisher, who also founded the Tufton Street Network of free market extremist think tanks in the UK, Institute for Ec Economic Affairs. He also founded the Atlas Network, which is, you know, the kind of market extremist networks that are funding, you know, climate change denial. They, they fund the Heartland Institute in, in the United States. They, you know, they, and they, you know, those guys also have uh, connections with, you know, the Koch brothers. Um, and it's, and they have huge money from them as well. And, and other big kind of industrialist uh, billionaires and, and so forth. So what we have here is very interesting that you have someone like Charles Murray who was incubated by these guys and it wasn't an accident. He was incubated because extremely powerful people who controlled the most powerful industries in the world, especially in, in the United States, even in Britain and Europe, they needed to justify those outcomes. They wanted people to not understand the causes of those outcomes. And they wanted people to say that they aren't the cause. It's them. It's those black people. It's those migrants. It's those Muslims. It's those Jews. It's those Marxists. It's those, it's whoever you want it to be at the time. And that's why it's so crucial to recognize that this ideology is malleable, but it has a core structure. And the core structure actually originated in Nazi ideology. It was an anti-Semitic Nazi ideology, but it's evolved. And the, th the things that have made it evolve is the way in which those industrialists have weaponized it. And of course, they've created a network of think tanks. They've created a network of foundations. And one of the things that those well, there's various things, but there's what many of the things those think tanks and foundations do is they fund that narrative and they yeah. do it in different ways. They use social media, but they use think tank reports. They use research. They also fund universities. They are they are paying millions and billions of, of, of dollars and pounds and francs and God knows what to create this alternate reality. And at the core of that reality is this ideology, this very, very... Um, unscientific ideology but it's a it's, it's a belief system that believes that people are fundamentally defined by their genetics um that there are ingrained hierarchies in nature and so and so and so forth and it's interesting how that pseudoscientific ideology dovetails so conveniently with the policy matrix of the right wing and the far right and what they say needs to be done to welfare and what they say needs to be done about education and what they say the key problems in society are and what they say how we explain the fact that there are these tremendous problems so this confuses people and i think what's happened in terms of the alt-right today 
is that the industrialists have begun to evolve, right? So yes, there's the Koch brothers, they're still there. Well, one of them is dead, but the other one's still there. There's, you know, Bannon and, and Mercer. So those guys, you know, Mercer and his funding network, those guys change, right? They change, they come in the scene, they start throwing money and they have diff they take it in different directions, which are unpredictable. And most recently, we've seen Silicon Valley. And this is just illustrative of the way in which the global order is changing because the, the centers of industrial power are shifting. You know, fossil fuels was the big thing and it's starting to shift because they're in their twilight to some extent, but they're still very powerful. And that's why these lobbies are still very powerful and they want to- They're trying to lengthen their, their dominance for as long as possible, to, you know, at our expense, yes. Absolutely. And then you've also got this new information disruption going on and you've got these tech barons who are now kind of rising up and these guys are obviously competing in some ways you know but they also have these they have shared alignments and one of the things they align on is what we do with the world's wealth and how it's organized and distributed and what we do about politics and they align on this really convenient idea that the people who already hold positions of power and hold all the wealth who happen to be really powerful rich white guys um, these guys are inherently deserving of their positions. It's all to do with their ingrained, brilliantly, genetically naturalized talents. Um, and that's and that's just a wonderfully convenient ideology for them that justifies their power. So why is it that people like Peter Thiel and Elon Musk, who are these now moving into the centers of the technology nodes, are, are kind of pushing this, this ideology? It's because it works for them. It makes sense for them. And it's interesting to see how over time these networks have evolved and begun intersecting. And I don't think they all agree. So, you know, Putin has his own strategy and his own agenda, right? He has a very specific view of what he wants. And, you know, Elon Musk has a has a slightly differing view. You know, he's 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 not you know, but but what but it, it gets more murky when you start looking at the details of their ideologies and how they converge. Jim, you you wrote a really interesting piece about Elon Musk. Uh, I think it was a week ago, actually, um, where you kind of laid out some of his crazy racist background and ideas. And I think yeah, that, that was from a couple of years ago, but I, I I put it back up. Well, you put it back. I, I mean, it was just it was just so fascinating to see how he had a, his own trajectory. And it, you know, you know, his his racist dad and his South African upbringing, all the rest of it, and yeah. how it's propelled him into sympathizing with Nazi, sympathizing with these crazy eugenics ideas, but then also kind of finding a convergence point with kind of Russian cosmism, transhumanism, yeah. you know, this weird idea of multi-planetary civilization, um, and. More really, what's what again? What's disturbing about it is where that lands in terms of the political agenda and how these guys converge. Because I don't think most, and this is what's actually really frightening for me, is that because it's networked, I don't think the nodes in this network, I don't think they understand what they're building. No. I don't think they see it. So I don't think tr Trump doesn't know what the hell he's involved in. He doesn't he really, really doesn't. understand it. He's too fucking no. stupid. <laughs> but he's, but, he's, he but really do you know who does he's know? He's not a smart man. Yeah. But do Go you ahead. know who does know? The solution architect who built this knows exactly what's going on. And I would point to authoritarian leaders such as uh, MBS, Putin, Netanyahu, uh, you know, we've got Maloney in Italy. We've got Le Pen in France. We have uh, <clears throat> Reese Moog in the UK. We've got Farage in the UK. We have Trump here. We have Mitch McConnell here. Like the main players, the people who are actually moving the stones, I don't think uh, the public really knows who all these people are, right? And that's by design. They're hidden they're back. They don't want their machinations to be known. They want it to appear organic, but I would argue that it is, in fact, inorganic overall. Well, just just a quick comment um, on what High Five said. I think that there's this th th there's this combination of of things that are going on organically and inorganically. 
on the one hand, the way in which these networks have evolved over time has obviously been, it's been organic. I mean, they've, they've taken different directions. And of course, they weren't all connected at that, you know, 20 years ago, they were still forging connections. But what's interesting is how they have become increasingly interconnected and they forged deliberate connections. And you have this transatlantic network now, and that's why I call it the Alt-Reich, to get across this idea that there is actually an emerging, evolving plan. And not everyone in those nodes necessarily sees all of it. And not everyone necessarily understands the entire endpoint. But what's, what's frightening is the convergence points in the ideology where there is alignment. And that's what I find terrifying because you find these points of alignment around key things that they are saying. These guys seem to genuinely believe in eugenics at some level. They, like they, they really do seem to believe in this idea. Like Jordan Peterson is hook, line and sinker on this. Douglas Murray is on this. Douglas Murray was, saw, was seen sitting next to Elon Musk. Elon Musk has been tweeting race science out intermittently for the last year or two years or something. Yes. Peter Thiel has been, you know, hinting at this stuff for, for a long time. These guys can, are converging on these on these ideas. And that's just one element of it. You know, the other elements of it get even murkier about what do they believe about the role of technology in all of this? What do they believe about the structure of democracy? You know, Peter Thiel, has come, he's one of the few that have come out and said, look, democracy is done. And I'm, yeah. not, I'm done. With Freedom democracy. and democracy are incompatible, is what he yeah. said. And it, it, you know, the last one he gave, I think he said something like liberalism is exhausted, democracy is exhausted. And then he alluded to the Weimar Republic. Right. And he's, he's, he's saying these things bluntly and in the open. And then you've got Elon Musk kind of hinting at it, saying, you know, talking about how he's got concerns. Well, about... except when he when he quote tweets a Holocaust denier. Is that? Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's not, it's not hinting. But this, <laughs> civil this is war is inevitable. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, civil war is inevitable. These so this is this is the other civil war is inevitable is a trope that but was marginalized previously, right? It was this weird, right. strange, far right extremist idea. You had some American like replacement, but which has now been normalized. Yes, it's now yeah. been normalized. It's like you know, you had I I remember like ten years ago writing about this guy Morton Messerschmidt. Now I wrote about this guy, this Danish far right MP who was talking about. The great replacement theory saying that, you know, there's going to be hordes of migrants and Muslims who are at the gates of Vienna. Um, you know, he was talking about these ideas that actually inspired Anders Breivik to go and kill 77 people in 2011. Um, and you know, he wrote he was, a, he a, a website. 2,500 page manifesto about it. Yep. Yeah. And, and the website, this guy was, I mean, he, this, I mean, this, Morton Messerschmidt quoted the gates of Vienna in his wording and the gates of vienna is a, is a well-known far-right website that inspired breivik you know he quoted that in his manifesto um and he's talking about civil war civil you know europe's going to be overcome with insurgencies within within a certain time frame which by the way we are at now and it hasn't happened so he's wrong about that but will he admit it no and this guy is friends with Nigel Farage, long-time friends. They worked with each other in the European Parliament. Um, uh, Nigel Farage endorsed him for leadership of the, the Danish People's Party, which, and he's now leader. Tommy Robinson, who instigated the riots uh, that, just, that just took off, was actually at... Uh, he launched his film, Silenced, which is full of ridiculous disinformation about all sorts of things, in Danish Parliament, with that guy, Morton Messerschmitt, just a year ago. And then he screened that film weeks before the riots in the UK on Trafalgar Square, which was attended by, of course, dozens of far-right groups, including, you know, many political groups, fringe political groups that actually went on to actually participate in the riots, you know, just a couple of days later. So we're seeing this convergence. And the most disturbing element of it is that these guys are now openly admitting that violence and destabilization is actually the way you pursue your political agenda when the elections don't work when democracy is exhausted you can go for authoritarianism you can go for violence you can go for paramilitary violence this rhetoric is becoming more and more normalized and where does that leave us it leaves us with pure fascism it's not even neo-fascism 
it's, it's a new kind of fascism because it's different to what came before. One of its characteristics is that it denies being fascist. I mean, the Nazis pretty much owned it, right? They're like, we're Nazis. We don't like Jews. We're going to kill you. Well, they they try they tried to be sneaky with socialists, right? The, the yes. National Socialist Party, but you know <laughs> they, they gave up on that after pretty quickly. <laughs> so, can I can I just I just have to point out something real fast? We talk about Tommy Robinson. One of the things I found out about Tommy Robinson is the funding for his film came from a cryptocurrency company, I believe, and yeah. uh, that just ties it back to. Things I've been talking about for four years, which are Silicon Valley and money laundering. So anyway. And and crypto was all throughout the 277 page affidavit that I read last night. Everything was paid, just as we've been saying that's the wonderful, you know, quote unquote currency for money launderers and extortionists, etc. So anybody who wants to know more about what Hi-Fi just brought up and what you mentioned should read. Nafiz's report in Byline Times from August 8th, exposing the real UK race riot instigators, the key players and transatlantic network around Tommy Robinson. That's really important. It shows the links to Europe, Russia, and of course, uh, people like the aforementioned Robert Mercer. Um, but I wanna just do a quick quote, and I know that we're almost, our time is almost up and we're gonna need to bring you back, please, to spend more time with us because uh, this is just, we could do this, you know, all day. Three years ago, I interviewed Jim Stewartson for Byline Times on the gamification of conspiracy and how this brainwashed death cult that we saw show up at the Capitol on January 6th was formed. And we talked a lot about the intentions of people like Mike Flynn, Eric Prince, um, Peter Thiel, Steve Bannon, Roger Stone. And here's something that Jim said that I always think about. They want to destroy global liberal democracy and replace it with fascism and authoritarianism because they believe that situation is the best for them and they may be right. Because if you're king of the world, what do you need all these people for? Here we are on the precipice of not only watching the world lurch toward authoritarianism in many, many countries, but we're also lurching toward that greater crisis, which I know you know so much about, and that is global warming that is occurring. That's like a real thing. And I think that there's some of these nodes that we were talking about that may just be kind of going along and may not really know what they're building. And I think some of them know exactly what they're building and are building some sort of new feudalism where we get to be the peasants and deal with the harsh elements while they're off in their bunkers in New Zealand and Hawaii. And I just, I know that you're the perfect person to get a comment on that from. So, I mean, one of the key themes in the book is that the alt Reich is essentially an anti-human, anti-planetary movement. And the reason it's emerged is because the various networks who are the most powerful in the system need to find a way to hold on to their power and so denying climate change is an element of that but it's been driven by this crisis and i think what you know what people don't realize is that all of the problems that we're seeing you know we talk about this cost of living crisis you know this massive inflation you know the 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 problems with our economies the rising inequalities it's being driven by these fundamental systemic problems. And one of the key areas of that is our dependence on fossil fuels. So these guys don't want us to know that fossil fuels are in their twilight, that one of the reasons our economies are essentially in this stage of escalating crisis, and it just doesn't seem to go away no matter what we do, no matter which government is coming in, they're finding it so difficult to do something about it is because fossil fuels are becoming more expensive to get out. There's a little bit less of it around. The good stuff, pretty much, you know, the really cheap good stuff, we kind of uh, began to shift away from that around 2005, 2006. And as we've done that, we've been scrabbling around for the more expensive stuff. And that's not to say there's not tons of it out there. There's tons of that stuff there. But it's really difficult to get out of the ground. It's far more expensive. And that means we're just putting more and more money. And there's this kind of there's this technical concept that sounds really kind of oh you're so clever if you use that word but it's really really simple it's energy return on investment 
And it simply means how much energy you use to get a certain amount of energy out. And scientists have studied this and they've pretty much come to a consensus and they disagree about certain assumptions and how to qualify it and quantify it in different ways. But they, they've all kind of converged on a simple conclusion, which is that over the last, say, 50 years or so, the, the kind of the, the, that ratio, the EROI, as they abbreviate it, is, has literally hemorrhaged by around half or more than half and is going down. So the amount of energy return that we're getting from fossil fuels is, is massively in decline and it's been accelerating in the ninth, since the 1970s, since then. So what's, when you plot these things on graphs, you can see this really interesting correlation that the popularity of the far right and, and, and the hard right has actually grown slowly as the EROI has gone down and inflation has gone up and growth, economic growth has gone down and equality has gone up. And so you see all these different trends and they're interconnected. They're part of a global system that is in crisis. And I think the, the climate crisis is kind of like, it's not the whole crisis, not the only crisis, but it's the crisis that tells us that the trajectory that we're on is clearly anti-human, anti-planetary, anti-life. You know, it's, it's one that literally is saying to us that you keep going down this road and guys, it's, it's, it's done, it's over. I mean, you can talk about authoritarianism all you want, but what good is a techno-fascist regime on a planet that basically is burning and which is about to be engulfed, it's going to, be, it's going to become uninhabitable. I mean, that's the scientific consensus. 99% of scientists have said this it's in the, in the peer-reviewed literature, that that's the trajectory on by towards the end of century. That's not very long to go. So these guys, they might think they know what they're building, but they really don't actually have a clue. Uh, if I might, the... Uh, uh, I what i see is a lot of the apocalypse myth whether it comes from christianity or on the far right you've got all kinds of crazy ideas of the kali yuga and and things right but they all um come down to the simple idea there must be an apocalypse the there must be the you know the world heating up for them is a sign that we're getting closer to the end times or whatever their particular ideology is, but there always seems to be some magical moment that makes it not matter, right? That makes it not matter that we're actually committing suicide as a species um, uh, because, you know, ultimately these are death cults. Um, and and so they, they, they need to find that construction, that doomsday event. And I'm, I'll say one last thing. Um, my favorite quote uh, from Voltaire, um, those who can make you believe absurdities are those who can make you commit atrocities. He said that a long time ago. And to me, um, all of this is basically that, right? It's about control. It's about getting people to believe things that benefit others. Um, so uh, anyway, I, I, I wanted to throw that in and, and I'm so grateful for your work, Ben, and that you came today. Me too. Dr. Nafiz Ahmed, please do come back. Hi-Fi, do you have a final word? I just, uh, you know, so in, in what I do when I design systems, yes, we are very focused on what is our return on an investment, our ROI. The other thing we're also in, uh, focused on is what's called the TCO, the total cost of ownership. And uh, I think, you know, people need to understand that our total cost of ownership for continuing on a petroleum based energy system is we're no longer going to exist as a species. But my final question for you, sir. One of the things we talk about on this program a lot is the class war. And a lot of people kind of ignore the fact that the class war is ongoing. Um, would you say from your your work from your research that billionaires that oligarchs around the globe are funding and engaging in class warfare against the rest of us yes or no i would say that absolutely we've got very clear evidence and i don't want to homogenize all billionaires 
right? Although I do have questions that if you're a billionaire, did you, how did how, you make How did you get that, right? <laughs> yeah, how did you get that? I mean, even like, I mean, Taylor Swift, my daughter loves Taylor Swift, right? Taylor Swift seems like a nice, really nice person and everything, but how, you know, how, do, is the, it's not, it's not about her. It's about the system. It is, you know, is, is it possible to make that much money without hurting someone somewhere, without doing any justice somewhere? I don't think it is. Um, and so what is clear is that there is a class of billionaires. And, you know, maybe there's good billionaires and there are some philanthropists out there who are done trying to do some good in the world. But there is a class of billionaires who sees us as the enemy. And they are behind the alt Reich. They are actively creating and formulating and trying to lend coherence to an ideology that they want to use to confuse us and to subjugate us. And the end result of that is actually that the entire species goes to hell. So that's not great for anyone. It's not great for the people who support this. And you know what I would say to the people who, you know, are, you know, you, if you believe in something and you believe that there is, you know, an apocalypse coming and all the rest of it, maybe, you know, what we see before us to overcome the apocalypse is the human spirit and human choice. And that, you know, it's not, this isn't, you know, we're not supposed to sit here and say, let's all just become destroyed. But that in order for us to get to that kingdom that comes after that, we've got to build it. We've got to take responsibility. You know, we've got to stop gaslighting our brothers and sisters. And we've got to start building a beautiful kingdom, you know, on earth based on love, based on compassion, based on the values we supposedly say we believe in. Well, if we believe in those values, then we need to take responsibility for that. And we need to start building that here and now in our lives. And that means taking a good look in the mirror. That's the stuff that I take away from the different faiths. It doesn't matter whether you believe them or not, but I think, you know, humanists and, and, and people of faith kind of have, you know, when we're having good dialogues, that's kind of what we agree on. That yeah, you know, we guys we need to look at look at ourselves. We've got to hold ourselves to account. We've got to keep that ego in check. We've got to listen listen to others. We've got to learn. Those are the things that will get us through. That will, that that will get us by, and that's how we can build new systems that can really work. Not this crazy bullshit, which is literally narcissism on steroids. How can these people not see that? That's it. it's just crazy. <laughs> I mean, that is such a beautiful place to end it. <laughs> I just want to like leave it right there. Dr. Nafiz Ahmed, thank you so much for being with us here today. The book is alt Rife. Please support his work. Is there anything else that we can support that our viewers can support that you're working on or uh, anything else that it's important that they know about? I know. I mean, that's the main thing. I, I have a newsletter called ageoftransformation.org. Uh, where I I focus on kind of systems thinking for the moment we find us I call I call this moment uh, a global phase shift or a planetary phase shift I think everything is going through a huge transformation um, and yeah there is a there is a risk of collapse but there's also a tremendous possibility of, of, of renewal and hope and and I, and that's what I'm really trying to focus energies on so that's another thing that people might find like a, a useful resource. Thank you so much. I feel a renewed hope just after this interview. Thank you. Thank you so much.